Welcome to the Coffee and Kidlet Show. If you've never seen this show before, I like to interview authors who have written children's books, really inspiring children's books. And I've been learning so much listening to these authors share their story and, and the inspiration behind their books. Today, I have a very special guest who was with me just two weeks ago, Christy Furnival. Um, I don't have the book that we talked about that time, but that was I Fear Not. You have it. Okay, good. And today we'll be talking about the not so friendly friend. Um, Christina, just give us again, just your background and tell us a little more about yourself. Yeah. Hi again. It's so fun to be back talking with you. Thank you for having me on again. Um, for anyone who didn't watch the episode a couple weeks ago, go back and watch it. Um, like and subscribe to Trust's channel. But um, I'm Christina Furnival. I go by Christy. You'll probably hear me say both or hear people call me both. Um, and I am a native San Diegan, born and raised out here until college years when I moved to Nashville, Tennessee for my undergraduate schooling at Vanderbilt. Then I stayed out there for graduate school at Lipscomb University and got my master's in professional counseling. Moved back to California and was licensed out here. So I'm at LPCC in California, and that stands for a licensed professional clinical counselor, which is mouthful to say that I'm a mental health therapist. Uh, there's lots of different licenses, so it's a little confusing, um, but I can provide in-person or telehealth therapy. And I started my career as a therapist working with children and youth and their families. And since having my own kids, I've transitioned into telehealth with adults and new moms. My daughter is six and she just started yesterday uh, first grade. And my son is four and a half and he's doing his final year of preschool. And they are just so amazing and so much fun and also quite a challenge, but um, wonderful kids. And um, so I've been in the field of mental health since about 2009. Um, and actually, oh, let me go back real quick. A little tidbit I didn't share last time. It's just fun to know. Uh, between college and graduate school, I took a year off and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I have always enjoyed acting and I had done plays as a kid, but I decided I moved back to LA just for that year and um, tried my hand at acting out, out in California and um, basically got nothing, but I was, a little <laughs> I didn't, I didn't find an agent. I didn't know the right way to go about it, but um, I put myself into a database for extra work. So getting to be a person in the background of projects um, that make, you know, crowd scenes or what have you. And I got to be on an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Mac and Charlie Die Part 2. And um, I was called, my, my character name was Hot European Dancer Girl. And um, we got to just like go into the bar and hang out with them. It was very, very fun. And um, I also found an audition for a reality show and I was selected and I was on a one episode of MTV's The Phone in 2009 and um, actually won a good chunk of change and then split it with the partner that they had me work with. Um, so reality show star over here kind of discreetly yeah. and that was a long time ago. But then decided, okay, uh, you know, I do want to become a therapist and I've had my fun. So let's go back to grad school and uh, finished up there. And I've worked in a variety of settings. I helped out at a domestic violence center. I um, did outreach for them. I led um, a support group for them. And I've worked in hospital program, outpatient programs. Um, I've worked for a large San Diego nonprofit where I provided parent education and one-on-one -on -one behavioral support. So what's really cool now is with my books, because I'm not working with kids in person anymore or on telehealth, because I feel like I, I'm kind of kitted out by my own children, um, that the way that I feel I'm able to help kids these days is through my books. So I've got my one hand in therapy world with adults and one hand in psychoeducational tools for kids with my books. That's a little bit about me. I have to ask, is it a little easier parenting having the background you have or is it <laughs> it's Actually, still chaos it's still chaos um and i <laughs> possibly maybe harder because i'm harder on myself because i'm like mm. oh this is i'm not doing what i should be doing you know and it's just we're all human and it's so hard and, it, and i feel like every day you're learning something new as a parent and every day your child is learning how to be a human and it doesn't always align so mm -hmm. it's just as hard <laughs> yeah 
I can I can understand that. Now, since you didn't mention your acting career, I, I have to say that I've been on national TV in two different continents, actually. Wow. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, I was in the crowd that the audience for the Tonight Show with Jay Leno one time. Awesome. Uh, I didn't say anything. I was just in the crowd. <laughs> and um, I was in kind of a it was a news clip about immigrants here in Norway. So, uh, yeah, just I wasn't I didn't speak or anything in that clip either. It was just kind of <laughs> B-roll. So, uh, sorry, don't put yourself down. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so which did you like better, San Diego or Nashville? So I have a special place in my heart for Nashville. Um, it's like, well, at least it was, it's changed so much since I lived there. I moved home in 2012. So 10 years ago, um, it was like the big little town, you know? So you, you knew everyone, you'd run into everyone. It felt like such a tight knit community, but then it also still had so much to do and so much to see. Um, I just absolutely adore Nashville and I can't wait to go back and visit sometime soon. I still have friends out there, so I need to plan the trip. Um, and then San Diego, you know, it's, it's my comfort born and raised here. I love the beach. So that was a downside for Nashville. They had like a nice lake that we would go to. Um, it wasn't the beach and my family's out here as well. So I think mm -hmm. if my parents weren't here, um, we might be inclined to move somewhere else. And my husband had lived before coming to California, actually met him in Nashville through a mutual friend, but he was living in Raleigh, North Carolina. And yeah. I've been to Raleigh several times now and I love Raleigh as well. So um, yeah, if we weren't anchored by family, we might try somewhere else. But San Diego is mm. beautiful. It used to be, you know, 72 and sunny, but now it's like 95 and really hot and no clouds. So I, it's just, everything's changing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm from Wilmington, North Carolina, which is kind of like Hollywood East, they like to call it. And um, um, my my youngest brother has done some some uh, what do you call it? Like uh, background acting? Is that what it's cool. called? Cool. Like, yeah. Yeah, just kind of in the crowd. Yeah, he he enjoyed that for a little while. But um, yeah, I've I've been to Nashville a few times, and actually, when I was in college, my last year when I was a senior, um, I went down for a conference in Nashville, and that might have been my first time. And uh, my boss's son was one of the coaches for Vanderbilt uh, basketball. Wow! Um, I, I didn't actually get to meet him, but I stayed in his apartment. I guess it was empty at the time, and I was able to stay there and, and go to this conference. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I also, what's that? Did you go honky tonkin? <laughs> to the bars I, downtown. I live the honky tonk life. So yeah. <laughs> You're like, um, I know that well, Christy. <laughs> right, right. No, I I really did in, enjoy Nashville though. I would say it's probably except for my hometown, Wilmington, it's probably my second favorite town. It, it's just such a, a fun atmosphere. It, it really is. is. Yeah, so let's talk about the not so friendly friend. Now, if I remember right, this was the was this the first one in the series? Yeah. Yes. So um, this was you you produced this last year, and um, tell us about what that is about. And uh, yeah, yeah. So the not so friendly friend was the book that accidentally came to be, and um, it's just been such a fortuitous journey that I've been on in this author world that. I, I hadn't had that goal as a, as a child. I always liked writing. Um, I, I thought I was decent at it. Um, I really love wordplay. I really like rhyming. But the way that this story came to happen was my daughter was having friends, problems at school. Um, she had this one friend in particular who would either be like, over the top excited to see my daughter, which felt really good when we dropped her off and this friend would come running towards her yelling my daughter's name or would be quite dismissive of my daughter. If it was like, if my daughter saw that friend first and went up to that friend, that friend was like not interested. And mm. my daughter was three at the time. So it was just, she was like, what is happening? Why is this friend not being nice to me sometimes with them being really nice to me other times? And having worked in the fields for so many years, I've got hundreds of social emotional books. So I went through like my friendship section and I've got a lot of great books, 
but they, they talked more about social skills um, or they had some themes that I've used with clients but didn't really necessarily apply to the situation with my daughter. And um, so I sat down with my phone and I just wrote this little rhyming story about um, a kind little girl who, uh, you know, try as she might, not everyone liked her. And on the one hand, that was okay. But on the other hand, she had a right to stand up for herself and let that person know that she didn't deserve to be treated that way. And so then it became this story about setting a very simple boundary. And um, then the pandemic happened and we didn't need that story for the moment anymore. And I forgot even about it. I forgot that it was in my phone. And um, in September 2020, somewhere around there, maybe it was earlier 2020, I found it on my in my phone and I reread it. And, you know, sometimes when you write something in the moment, you think it's great and glorious and then you come back to it and you're like, what was I thinking? Right. And when I reread this, I it actually struck me as quite good. And I thought, you know what, this helped my daughter for that time before the pandemic. And um, I feel like this could be a real book and help more children. And so I learned all that I could about becoming an author. I joined a million Facebook groups, probably a couple that I'm in with Travis. And uh, I joined the Society of, Ch of Children Book Writers and Illustrators, the San Diego chapter, and um, figured out how to submit my book to publishers. And um, my books are, are very niche, as are yours, because um, they're kind of children's self-help books. And so they're not, they're not just a story for the sake of story, which those have their own merit as well. But I, I knew I needed to find a publisher that got what I was trying to do. It's much more direct um, than, than a lot of children's books. I, I am not yet skilled at allegory and working in the themes underneath it. Like I'm, I'm in your face. And um, so I submitted to a publisher that I didn't actually know was doing children's books for a long time. Um, they're called PESI and PESI is a psychotherapy conference panels, trainings, workbooks company. So I've attended their conferences okay. and for years, and, um, I knew they had workbooks for therapists to use in session with clients or for therapists to improve their skills, but it wasn't until November, 2019 that they started producing children's books. So when I found them in my search, I thought, oh my gosh, this is perfect. They're, they're kind of new. I'm fully new let's let's send it to them and see what happens and uh, they actually emailed me back the very next day and within a month we had a book deal signed and the book was in production and um i found katie dwyer a fabulous mom and human uh to be the illustrator and so there it's a traditional publishing path but with kind of ma and pa practices in some ways where i got yeah. to have a lot more control and i worked with katie weekly or every other week to design the book you know all her illustrations but then I got to have my two cents in it and uh yeah so it came out in September 2021 and it has blown my mind um the life that this book has taken on its own um it's sold over 30,000 copies and around the world and I keep seeing it pop up in people's stories on Facebook and they or Instagram and they tag me and thank you anyone that has done that it was so nice to see how meaningful this book has been to so many people because um, it was very meaningful to my daughter. That That's really awesome. And, and I had been meaning to ask you about the publisher because I, I hadn't heard of it before and, and just your, your interaction with them. So that's, that's really cool that you were able to kind of find them on the ground floor, so to speak. And, and uh, yeah. Um, and both of your books are through PESI uh, publishing. So that's that's fantastic. Um, congratulations with that, and, and <laughs> for, you. To move forward so quickly too is impressive. So yeah, yeah, it's been kind of a whirlwind, and I've a, you know a lot of learning on the job, right? Just figuring it out as I go, but it's been really really rewarding, and just again really special to know that I'm putting out books that I, as a therapist who works with worked with kids, would have wanted to use in session that I now am creating these books. And my goal is to have them function for parents. Um, so at the back, there's, there's always conversation starters and discussion questions um, for teachers uh, in session and for therapists as well. So hopefully, I, I really try and take these complex topics and make them simple for a child, but make them available for kind of any setting that a child may be in. Yeah. Um, 
so let's let's get into some of the questions about kind of the the background of the book or or why you wrote this. What are some reasons why kids might not be friendly all the time? I'm sure there's as many reasons as there are stars in the sky, right? But I, yeah. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah, there really are. Every child is so different. Every child's wiring is so different. Every child's life experience is so different that they all come to the table underbaked, right? Our, our prefrontal cortex, this is the front part of our brain that controls our planning, our judgment, our reasoning, our logical thinking, our problem solving, like really fine-tuned skills that part doesn't finish developing until we're about 25. And so mm. if we think about taking five-year-olds and throwing them into kindergarten and upwards, they're, they're not practiced. They're not skilled in social skills. And especially, oh my gosh, with this pandemic, we've, we had two years of online school or no school or homeschool or different situations where children weren't exposed to what they would have been and the environments that they would have been. Parents weren't taking children to mommy and me classes or play dates. Um, you know, we weren't gathering as friend groups like we used to. And now that's that's happening again, which I'm so, so glad about because it was kind of like our kids' social skills got frozen. And then it's our job to kind of help them thaw out and warm up and, and get more skilled in, in these areas. So it, it's almost too hard to pinpoint what reasons could be there there was an old belief that children who bullied were had low self-esteem and current research is showing that that actually that's not true a lot of times most of the time they're actually quite socially adept and often the popular child they also might be larger in stature than kids there in their grade um, and there's this power hierarchy this imbalance of power and um, I think they, they just don't really get the lasting impact of what they're doing. And it seems funny at the time. Um, it, I think it can be malicious. There are kids absolutely who are malicious in their intent, but there are kids who also just aren't as aware. Um, and what's great is most schools these days, and I'd venture to say all um, or like 90% have bullying prevention programs and protocols to really support children in a way that they didn't before. It used to be a lot of, okay, well, this this child, this child who bullies is suspended or they're expelled, you know, punitive discipline. And now there's more of kind of two sides to it. One is the restorative justice side where they support the child who is engaging in bullying behaviors to really grow in empathy, grow in an understanding of what they're doing and grow as a human versus just punishing them. And then on the other side, wraparound support for the child who is being bullied to feel protected and supported. Um, so that's that's the good news about it, even though maybe why it's happening, it's hard to, to nail down. There's much more support than there used to be to help our kids. Yeah, I've, I've even kind of noticed that from being across the pond, so to speak, um, just, you know, reading the news and, and watching social media, there seems to be a lot more talk about taking or, you know, being aware of bullying and, and preventing it. Um, so I think, you know, that's fantastic. I, I don't know all the measures that they're, they're taking over there, but um, yeah, I think it's so great that they're sort of focusing on that more kind of wish they had that when we were kids. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I personally believe there's no such thing as a bad kid. Would you agree with that? Or, or what's your take on that? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Um, no, I think we're all born benevolent. There's also research that shows that children just want to help. They want to be good. They want to care. I think, unfortunately, a lot of our kids go through trauma, um, sometimes even in the womb. And mm. there's even research that shows generational trauma, um, that it's in our, the eggs that come down from grandma and if grandma went through trauma grandchild may have remnants of stuff mm -hmm. in, in them um i i don't know about that too deeply um i don't know how they test that i don't know how they're aware of right. that but yeah. uh, the idea is our kids go through a lot of hard stuff and um we also are much more privy to a lot more negativity uh with the news and the media and um parents are stressed the heck out right now in life it just kind of feels like bad things are happening one after the next and our stress leads into them and um 
yeah, it just, it's not easy being a kid these days, but I do believe kids are good. You mentioned um, with the pandemic, do you think it's been hard for kids to kind of ju- adjust socially during that, that whole season? Yes, I certainly. This is like the whole world turned upside down. And mm-hmm. I looked out that our, our kids weren't grade school yet when everything did shut down because yeah. they were used to being home with me. It just felt normal. We just didn't see other people. Um, but for children that were in school or particularly in high school going to college, where your life is your friends and you're used to kind of having certain freedoms, that was a huge adjustment. Um, and I think it also depends on a child's temperament, how much they were impacted. It depends on the the messaging they were receiving from their family. Was it one of optimism? Was it one of pessimism? It, and how did that shape how our children t- talk to themselves and tell their own story about what happened? Um, it's hard times. So this book is is actually a whole, it it pretty much focuses on setting boundaries. Yes. So why is it so important for kids to set boundaries with their friends? I personally think boundaries are a superpower. I, I think it's a brilliant thing to teach children when they're young that they can carry with them throughout their life. And boundaries enable, they do a couple of things. They enable a child to first recognize who they are what they value, that they matter, that what they value, want, and need matter, and then that they're allowed to have a voice to protect those things. And so I see the boundaries as this kind of self-protection. And it also, starting this conversation, it, it informs children about what good treatment is and what not good treatment is. And we don't have to tolerate and accept if our friend who's our, let's say we call them our best friend, but they're really mean to us all the time and it makes us feel really bad. Actually, that's not a healthy friendship. And you are allowed to stand up for yourself and and let that other person know that A, you don't like how they're treating you and B, that you don't have to stand there for it. And um, it, so that it's, it's a skill, it's learned, it's something like a muscle where you, you have to practice. It feels uncomfortable or maybe even painful at first, especially I think culturally, it's changing now, but boundaries or asserting yourself was seen as um, rude. And I think a lot of our culture is like, well, politeness, you know, above all else. And um, I think boundary setting can be done in a very kind, gentle way, but I don't think you have to be polite. And I, and I think um, our children need to know that they are worth protecting that they are worth standing up for themselves and that they own their own experience, they own their own feelings. And whoever they're setting the boundary with may have feelings that aren't great in response to your boundary, but that's not our child's responsibility to manage someone else's emotions. It's that child's responsibility. And we can set a boundary in a kind enough way and allow that other child the space to process their re- their own reaction to the boundary. I'm I'm thinking about forgiveness and, and I believe that, you know, forgiveness is very important and, and we should be able to forgive in, in any circumstance. But how does this relate to setting boundaries? I mean, even even though you are forgiving, sometimes you still have to set boundaries. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess it depends what you consider forgiveness to be it, in a lot of conversations nowadays, forgiveness is something you do for yourself. I'm forgiving that person for my own sake. I'm not going to harbor negativity and discontent over a situation that has passed. Some people consider forgiveness something that you do. Oh, I, I'm showing you that I'm forgiving you. Mm-hmm. Um, and even that can have multiple angles where I'm showing you I'm forgiving you, but I'm still not um, interested to be treated that way again. Or I'm mm-hmm. showing you I'm forgiving you and we're going to try and hop right back in where we were. Um, so I think everything in life, I feel like is on a spectrum and middle ground is somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. And I would say forgiveness in terms of boundaries is somewhere, somewhere in the middle as well, where, um, you can let go of any anger or, or upset where you can express to them that, you know, that like your question before, you're a good person and you made a mistake and, I will continue to protect myself and Mm -hmm. I will continue to expect healthy treatment and love and care. And we either can work together in this honesty and authenticity about who I am and who you are and who we are, or 
we can make the intentional choice to to not do that together. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, I, I want to pull up this picture from the book and ask you. Oh, I haven't shared it yet. Hang on, just a minute. Let me pull that up. Fancy tech stuff. All right. There we go. Um, this is this is from the book, and uh, the question with this is, how does the girl in the book set boundaries with a bully? So she's been kind of faced with this bully that that, um, and I don't even know if you would describe her as a bully. She's just not very nice. Um, yeah, the interaction is is not so kind from her. Um, how does she respond? So I lo I love this page and. Um she confidently lets this other child know who earlier in the story has knocked down her block tower, who they were gardening at school together, has pulled out her plants. Um, there are also scenes where they are playing nicely together. And so it's confusing. And she takes that information and she actually goes to her parents and she sits down. She's got both her parents or caregivers, whoever you want them to be in the story and sits down with them and talks about it and comes to this conclusion that I need to set a boundary. And, um, comes back to the friend and lets the friend know, I'm all done. If you want to be kind, I'd be glad if you play. But if you don't treat me right, you can go on your way. And what I was trying to do with this message, because like you said, this this child on the right-hand side with the orange shorts is not necessarily a bully. The term for bully is someone who intentionally and repeatedly with, with malicious intent harms another person with their words or their actions with this power imbalance. This person is a friend who's getting it wrong half the time. And um, so she's letting this friend know, I'm not judging you. I don't hate you. I'm not saying you're bad. I'm saying if you're not treating me how I want to be treated, then this is what's going to happen because I'm in control of myself. So it says you can go on your way. And then the next page, she says, I'll play with your friends who make me feel good and treat me with love just like a friend should. And so she's kind of laying it out there. This is me. This is what I need. When Oh, and then it continues. But basically, when you're ready to change and be nice again, you're welcome to join and play with us then. And so she, it's the idea with boundaries is that they're not rigid. You're not closing yourself off to the good things in relationships. And they're not porous, opening yourself up to all the heavy stuff of, of friendships or being too dependent or inter interdependent, but boundaries should be firm yet flexible. And so that's what she's doing here. She's saying, this is how I want to be treated. That's her firm side, but the flexible side is that you're still welcome to play with us. You just have to treat me right. And so it's a pretty powerful, but simple boundary. Yeah. And um, I, I really, I really like that it's, it's kind of taking the control back. Um, if, if this other girl is kind of controlling the situation and they decide when they're going to be nice, when they're going to be mean, when they can play together, when they can't, um, setting boundaries is kind of like taking that control back and saying, you know what, you can play with me if you treat me right, but, uh, otherwise we'll do our own thing. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's really smart. And I, I think that's, you know, something that we can apply even to our own lives as adults, um, when we can interact with others, you know. Yeah, I can't tell you how many adults have read this and been like, where was this when I was a kid? I'm 35 <laughs> and I'm just learning about how to set a boundary. And and it's exactly that. By reading this to our kids, it, it does help adults because it makes us you know, reflect and think, hmm, you know what? I, I've been, for the sake of comfort, short-term comfort, not been speaking up for long-term discomfort because now I'm in situations where people don't know they're crossing my boundaries because I haven't made mm -hmm. it clear. And so for our kids to teach this now, if they are in, engaged in situations where someone's mistreating them, they're going to be more likely to speak up. And maybe it nips it in the bud before it grows into this big thing where you feel like you do need to get a teacher or a school involved. What should we as parents do to, to teach these boundaries to our kids? I had a similar answer when we spoke about fear not and supporting our children mm -hmm. with anxiety. And it's modeling. And again, kind of going back to what I was just saying right, right now, reflecting on ourselves, if we're not practiced in setting boundaries and we're not comfortable, we're not showing our children that it can be done, that it's something that our family does, that we all value ourselves enough to do that, 
So that would be my first recommendation is to sit and reflect and think, are there situations that you've shied away from setting boundaries and why? And what is that how you want to handle things? How could you handle them differently? Um, what message are you trying to get across to your children? Um, and I said this earlier, but there's this idea that setting a boundary is, is mean. And it's, it's probably the kindest thing you could do for yourself and for your relationship because it just lays your cards on the table. It lets whoever you're in a relationship with, whether it's a, a deep, close relationship or a stranger at a restaurant, it, it le- just lays things out. So an example that I give is if you're at a restaurant with your kids and you're brought the wrong meal, a lot of us, myself included at certain times in my life, would be like, hmm, thank you. <laughs> hey, that's not what I ordered. Um, and we might like say it to our friends annoyingly, but like annoyed, but we don't take it further to actually remedy the situation for ourselves. And that would be the perfect situation to explain talk through your process out loud with your child and say, oh no, that's not what I ordered. I'm sure the server would want me to get the food that I ordered. I'm sure the cook would want me to get the food that I ordered. And I certainly want the food that I asked for. So when they come back, I'll just let them know of the mistake so that they can fix it for us. And it's all in how we angle it. Cause we could think, oh, I don't want to be rude, but that's the truth. They probably do want to give you the food that you asked for and you deserve the food that you asked for. And your child then sees, wow, my mom kindly explains, oops, this wasn't what I asked for. Oh, you know, I think we must have misheard each other. I really wanted the blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm so sorry. And then they take care of it. Moment pass, discomfort, small and short. And then, you know, high levels of satisfaction because you're getting what you asked for. And for your children, they get to see, okay, that's how it's done. It, It can be done in a really nice way. And then supporting your kids at home, at school, um, with friends, with siblings, with yourself, how to, how to have a voice and allowing your child to have a voice. And part of this goes into your parenting style um, because some parents are like, I am parent, what I say goes because I said so, um, more authoritarian style of parenting. And while we all want obedient children, it doesn't teach our children that what they say and think matter um, or that they are allowed to voice their thoughts and opinions. Um, and so the preferred parenting style, if you reflect on your parenting style, has to be authoritative or democratic. And that's the idea that you're still the boss. You're you still a final say, but you're willing to listen and engage with your child in a way that makes them feel heard. And then you still get to be the one that makes the decision in the end. So they're allowed to have a voice. They're allowed to speak up. And maybe you do consider that and you change what you had said before if it makes sense in, in the situation. So modeling, parenting, talking, all, all the things. I'm so glad that you brought up the whole restaurant thing because that, that totally makes sense, you know, and, and we need to be polite in the way we respond, you know, but at the same time, if if the waitress or the waiter comes back and they're rude about the whole situation, then it's like, okay, I'm going to set this boundary <laughs> right now. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, I, I had a grandparent that uh, I, I adored, you know, I, they were like a mentor to me, except in restaurants. <laughs> They were oh, no. so rude with the waitresses all the time. And um, I just wanted to kind of slide under the table, you know, <laughs> but um, that's funny. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, we we need to be able to be advocates for ourselves, even as parents. And, and I see that even in my own life. Um, I think I mentioned uh, in the in the last episode that my youngest daughter is deaf. And so we're trying to teach her how to advocate for herself as as a deaf person. And and um, yeah, just let it be known when she needs people to repeat themselves or that she needs clear communication somehow. And, and, um, you know, my wife is having to remind me that I need to do the same thing being in another country that doesn't speak English. I need to be able to say, uh, can we speak in English so that I can get the full conversation or, you know, different things like that. And I I think it's so important for us to, to have the strength to advocate for ourselves especially in front of our kids so that they're learning that, as you said, modeling for our kids. So when kids, when our kids are, are facing something in school or on the playground or wherever, and they come and tell us, when is it our job to kind of step in? Or when should we just kind of wait and see how they handle it, so to speak? What do you think? 
I'd say initially support your child with a book like this, like the not so friendly friend, have these conversations and empower your child to go set those boundaries, report back, have a conversation. How did it go? Was it hard? Did it work? Okay. It didn't. Okay. But you, you, I'm proud of you. You stood up for yourself. You did the absolute right thing and I'm here for you. And sometimes parents and children don't want parents going to the school because there is this fear that it'll make it worse. And I think in the past it, it probably did sometimes. Now, since we were talking about schools have these programs and protocols in place, for the most part, you can trust that your school, your teacher, your administrators will kind of wrap themselves around your child to support. Um, they'll ha be more alert, eyes and ears on the playground, in the classroom for covert bullying situations, for overt bullying situations, and will know what to do to step in. And if they aren't informed about it by you as the parent, they may not know to look for some of those situations. So if you're feeling like your child did their best and it's just still not being handled, absolutely go to the school, talk to the teacher, talk to the principal or the director and find out what their protocol is and how they plan to step in to support your child. And if you're not satisfied, then potentially there's other steps that you need to take as well. But um, your parent gets pretty good and Let's not let you shy away from supporting your child for fear of, of it getting worse because usually it'll these days it, it helps make it better. Yeah, and and I really like the um, the picture that you have in your book as well, where where the girl is speaking to her parents about the situation and and um, you know are there questions that we can ask because I don't I don't know that that kids are so ready to tell their parents even that that they're being that someone is being mean in school or whatever. What are there specific questions that we should be asking on a regular basis or occasionally? Well, I think a lot of times we pick up our kids from school and we're like, how was school? And they're like, good. What'd you do? I don't know. You know, like you're like, oh, okay, that's all I'm going to get. And so there, there are lots more kind of specific questions that you can ask just to kind of get the conversation going. Because I think if you just drill straight in, like, is someone bullying you? Is anyone being mean to you? They're going to be like, well, no, what's, what are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, but if you're like, hey, who are your friends? Well, well, who did you play with at recess today? Or who did you have lunch with? Like, did anyone do anything funny? It, you know, and just kind of get that conversation going. Sometimes it helps if you bring up a friend. Oh, how is so-and-so doing with so-and-so? Because maybe you know a little background. That might start naturally to kind of peel the layers back on the conversation. But I have heard from so many parents that when they read The Not-So-Friendly Friend with their children, they learned about a situation at school that they had no idea. So I think even just having this conversation about what a boundary is, about what healthy friendships are, it it helps the child realize, oh, I thought sometimes kids were just mean. Well, yeah, they are, but mm -hmm. also you have the right to speak up. And you also have the right to not spend a lot of time with someone that doesn't make you feel good. And um, so at the back of the book, we've got conversation starters and discussion questions. And they're just kind of to reinforce what was learned in the book. So what is a boundary when and why might we want to set one? Is it easy or hard to do? What is a good friend? What did they say or do? If I set a boundary, am I mean? So um, I think this is a really good place to start. And um, on my website, christinafurnival.com, I also have um, three different, well, it's one grouping PDF, but it's for three different age groups. So for preschool, early elementary aged and late elementary aged, um, little, just one page or worksheet, or might be two pages on friendships and on boundary setting. And that can just, again, help get the ball rolling in those conversations and might give you information that you didn't know before. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I think this question is probably a bit obvious, but um, how do boundaries differ between those in our class or those, our siblings at home? Oh, I'm curious how it's obvious. What what what's the answer? To this? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe the boundaries should be the same either way. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> I, I was thinking thinking about this question, and I'm like, it's it's harder in a family. It is. So yes, your boundaries should be. I will not allow myself to be mistreated. Um, but when you are in the same thousand square feet as all your family members and um, there's no really place to get away from them or no other person to go play with. Um, it can be really hard. Plus there's this, just, there's this love. And then there's this push pull of wants and needs and who's are more important. No one's, but so 
one of the things that I work with my kids on, because I've got a daughter and a son, sometimes they play lovely together. Sometimes they're very not nice to each other, um, is this idea of, of kind of separating the problem from them. So working with them to be like, okay, my daughter wants this. My son wants this and having this conversation with them. So you want to do this, but he wants to do this. So how can you guys work together to make, find a compromise and make that work? Or when do you know when you're at the point where it's like, okay, we actually need to play separately now. And I'm trying to coach them through that instead of just being like, don't hit or don't yell as I'm yelling, you know, don't, don't this, don't that, but giving them what they can do, that would be better and more effective. And it's, um, so I'm really trying to coach them in the household and then hope that that translates to their friendships um, on the playground as well. But it is, it's a little easier with friends and a little easier with strangers to be like, I'm not cool with that than it is with our family. Sometimes we are much more on the aggressive side of things and um, not the collaborative side of things. I know if your kids are anything like mine, they can be playing very sweetly one minute and then at each other's throats the next, and then yeah. it's back to being sweet again. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, sometimes back you can sit forth. back and just see, see how it transpires because part of their learning and practicing and they may get it wrong, but then they may figure it out and realize as they're having this heated conversation, Oh no, actually we do. Okay. We figured it out. Okay. Now we're back to it. You know, sometimes you don't have to step in. So it's a judgment call. Yeah. Yeah. In the back of the book, I believe you mentioned the word assertive and, and being ass assertive. Um, what's the difference between being mean and being assertive? You know, as uh, you know, as we're setting boundaries, we should be assertive, but, but that could potentially come across as being mean. So what's yeah. the difference there? The, it's probably a gray area. And I think part of it goes back to what we were saying before about I'm responsible for me, for my thoughts, for my feelings, and another person is responsible for them and their experience and their thoughts and their feelings. We're all responsible for ourselves. And if we all take responsibility for ourselves, then we don't have to worry as much about what their reaction to our boundary might be. But when it comes to being assertive versus being mean, I would think of mean as more of like the aggressive side of boundary setting, whereas assertive is more on the other side. And so assertive is you're, you're asserting yourself. So you're speaking up and you're stating, owning yourself, what works or what doesn't work for you. And what's really helpful here is the I statement language. I don't know if you've heard of it before anyone watching, but the idea is when we use an I statement, we're owning ourselves. So I feel really hurt emotionally and physically when I'm not treated nicely. So that's all about me. The you version of that, which would be maybe leaning towards the more aggressive side. And in language, at least in English, it's easier to go this way is you make me so mad when you this or that. And now the underlying message may be the same, but the, the mode of delivery is very different. I feel really hurt when I'm not being treated nicely. You're so rude. You're so mean when you do this. Mm -hmm. Our goal is like, stop, right? Please stop. That's the, that's the boundary we're trying to set there. But the delivery is different. And so to be assertive, we're going to own ourselves. We're going to use the I, I statement language and um, try and steer away from the you language. Now, that doesn't mean we can't say the word you. So I feel really hurt when I'm mistreated. And when you pushed me yesterday at recess, I, I was super sad and really confused. So I'm owning my own reaction to what happened. So the you can be in there, but I'm not judging that person. I'm not attacking that person. Whereas the you language is like putting up your verbal dukes and um, they're going to put theirs right back up too. Now, again, the child to either statement may not be pleased because they did what they did and they might not want to have to deal with the repercussions of their own choices. But if you say it this way, they're less likely to become defensive. If you say it this way, they're 100% going to be defensive about it. Um, so it, it's a skill, it's nuanced, uh, but I statements are helpful. That's such powerful advice, um, especially for kids uh, to, to kind of focus even their own language and how they say things to, to kind of share their own emotions and how they feel in a situation rather than telling the other person how terrible how they are rude or terrible they are yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah that's awesome um christina tell us uh you've got two books out now 
Is there anything else coming? I, I can't remember if I asked you this before. What's um, next? Yes, there's more in the pipeline. Um, I have written the third book. I'm editing it. Um, the working title that I have given it is Think, Think Again. And the subtitle, I have no idea, but it's something along the lines of how to ditch negative thinking for a resilient mind. And um, it's based in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is my bread and butter. And that's this idea that this triad of our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviors and how they're all interconnected. And basically, I want to empower children again from a younger age than going to therapy in their 30s to realize how an event can happen. And two different people will think about it in different ways. And it will impact them differently because of how they think about it. And they will go make different choices about how to handle it based on how they think and feel about it. So if our children can learn, they're called cognitive distortions or thinking errors, but I call them unhelpful thinking. If we can help our child realize when they're using a certain type of style of thinking that might actually make their own situation worse, might make them feel worse. And that there can be an alternative thought that is more helpful, just as true, if not more true, um, that will shift their feeling and shift their behavior kind of down the trickle effect of that, um, that they have the power to bounce back, that they have the power to be resilient against all of life's ups and downs, um, then we're gifting them with with this robustness that they might not have had otherwise. And some people are more inclined to think that way. And some people are more optimistic or positive. And this isn't just about the power of positivity, but it's about kind of not getting in your own way with letting your thoughts bring you down. So that's book three. I'm planning to turn it in soon, as soon as I'm done with it. And um, I'm also working with Pessie on a flip chart, which is a tool for in the therapy session in person. And it's like a stand up book. And it has a side facing therapist and a side facing the client. And on the client facing side, it's dry erase. So they can work on activities in session. And on the therapist side, it gives prompts and more helpful information for kind of how to engage with the tool with the client. And it will be on feelings for kids. So we've got a couple of things in the works. Is is Katie involved in that as well? Is she doing like illustrations for the flip chart? Or, yeah. Katie is doing it. Will, hopefully we'll be in contract soon, hopefully. And then hopefully she will do book three. Um, yeah. and for the flip chart, I'm not sure how they do that. This is my first okay. video with that. So I don't know yeah. if they, they have a graphic designer in house. So I don't know if she, if that's her, her baby, um, I will find out. So uh, fear not as well as the not so friendly friend, this, these both books, as well as the third one that's coming is part of the capable kiddos series by Christina Furnival. I have links to both of these books down in the description where you can find them on Amazon and Christina Furnival.com, I believe is what you said was your yeah. website where they can download all kinds of uh, great resources. Are you doing like school visits um, or anything like that? Have you gotten into I, that? I have done some, I've done, Actually, it was more last year, uh, last school year, I did a couple outdoor schools. San Diego's got a lot of outdoor nomadic schools, which is really cool. They go to different parks for a week or different green spaces. Um, and so with with school regulations being more stringent, I was able to go do these outdoor school visits. And that was so much fun. I haven't yet tried to um, get actually into the school system, but I have some connections. Mm -hmm. So I think I need to probably just get over my own nerves and, and go do it. <laughs> Have you done school visits? No, I'm, I'm really trying, but I, I haven't really gotten my foot in the door yet. <laughs> and you know, the distance thing, that makes it difficult. Um, yeah. You would think that virtual visits would be possible, but just haven't been able to to uh, break the glass wall, break the glass ceiling. Yeah, whatever the phrase break is. Break the glass. Yeah, um, you'll do it. Yeah. It'll happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to in-person visits. That's what I'm looking forward to. But um Thanks so much, Christina. This this uh, whole series is so powerful, and I, I hope those who watch this video will go and check it out. Um, if anyone watching this really likes this kind of content, if you love seeing uh, inspiring children's books and how you can use them to really train your kids, this is the show for you, and I hope you'll hit the subscribe button. I have so many great authors in the lineup, um, such as Christina. Thank you for joining me today, Christina. Thank you so much, Travis. This was a blast. Next week, I have, I want to share this um, oh, before we go much further. This is uh, 
whoops, where'd it go? That's not what I wanted to show you. Um, <laughs> Here's my desktop. Yeah, there you go. Three ways to be brave with Carla Clark. Is that her name? Yeah, Carla yeah. Clark. I'm reading it right there. Um, such a cool series of books that, or a series of stories that is all bound into one book. And um, yeah, beautiful artwork. I love this book so much. Um, fantastic job that Carla has done. And um, Carla, sorry, I forgot your name. Um, <laughs> blank, blanked out for a second there, but uh, looking forward to talking with her next week. Thanks everyone for joining us and we will see you next week. Bye.